kids are gonna get crazy! <laughs> Most everyone's mad here. <laughs> Oh, this is gonna be a wild one today! Yes, welcome ladies and gentlemen to Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast! And there is a little bit of something that I want to tell you guys regarding this episode in particular of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast. Because once again, just like last week, uh, there really isn't a whole lot of animation news to go and discuss about. So this is going to be another episode where I'm only going to be reporting four stories instead of the usual five. However, I did actually see some people in the chat wall talking about that, that there really isn't a whole lot of animation news and things might not be as crazy. And I'm just going to say right now, oh, even though we only have four stories, there is more than enough craziness to go and talk about. Believe me when I say that the quality of these stories that I have, oh man, it will be something that will have a lot of people talking about. It will have no short supply of craziness. It's about to get nuts in here. Trust me, this is going to be really exciting right now. So with that said and done, uh, now that I have laid down what's going to be happening in this episode, I would like to go into the chat wall and I would like to ask you guys, are you all ready for this episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast? Because considering the craziness that we have right now, I don't even know if you guys would be ready for this, even if you would go and say yes. But it looks like a lot of people are going to take the risk anyway. So with that said, why not go ahead and get this one started? And with our first story, I just got to say that this was actually one of the biggest animation news stories that broke out last week. But the catch was that it literally broke out just last week from when I'm recording right now. And last week, right when I finished doing my entire episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast, suddenly, this story broke out and it just went everywhere on the internet. And it is a little bit annoying because you would get that instance happening and then suddenly when I would post it on YouTube two days later, I would get comments from people asking like, Oh, why didn't you cover this story? Why didn't you talk about this? And I had to go and tell them because it literally just came out right when I finished the last episode. So I had to go and reserve it for now. So with that said, now it is time that I can finally report this news and... Sadly, it is going to be a bit of a sad one. So let's begin and talk about the passing of Rusi Taylor, the Disney legend that has voiced Minnie Mouse for over 30 years. Unfortunately, she did pass away this week at the age of 75, or technically she passed away last week on July 26. Now, as I st stated, of course, Rusi Taylor is the voice of Minnie Mouse for the past 30 years, where ever since she got the part in 1986, she has been providing the voice of Minnie for hundreds of projects. And this can range from film, television, video games, commercials, and all that kind of stuff. Even a little list right here, um, and which by the way, I'm going to be using my source from the uh, Walt Disney Company's website. And... Uh, it stated that some of the things that she has appeared in includes Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Runaway Brain, Get a Horse, uh, Mickey, Donald, and Goofy, The Three Musketeers, Mickey Mouse Works, House of Mouse, Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, Mickey and the Roadster Racers, and the recent Mickey Mouse cartoons. And that's just a handful of the things that she has provided. And um, not only that... But there is also a very interesting trivia that is very well known about Rusi Taylor is that technically with Rusi, there is actually some truth of the fact that Mickey and Minnie were actually married. 
Uh, back in 1991, Rusi Taylor actually married Wayne Allwine, whom back then was the voice of Mickey Mouse. And they were, they were a happy couple together ever since, um, or up to the passing of Wayne in 2009, which was uh, very unfortunate. And uh, even for me, as someone who grew up in the 90s, um, I was... Uh, pretty much raised with both uh, Wayne and Rusi as the voice of Mickey and Minnie. And it is a very cute fact knowing that uh, there was an instance that Mickey and Minnie were actually married in real life. Uh, however, I do actually have some quotes that I want to read from people who have, um, who, who know, who have known Rusi Taylor, have worked with her and uh, they want to go and share their thoughts. So first of all, we got, uh, the head of Disney, the chief creative officer and chairman, Bob Iger, who has stated a few words about Rusi Taylor as he stated, uh, Minnie Mouse lost her voice with the passing of Rusi Taylor. For more than 30 years, Minnie and Rusi worked together to entertain millions around the world, a partnership that made Minnie a global icon and Rusi a Disney legend beloved by fans everywhere. We're so grateful for Rusi's talent as well as the tremendous spirit and great joy she brought to everything she did. It was a privilege to have known her and an honor to have worked with her, and we take comfort in the knowledge that her work will continue to entertain and inspire for generations to come. Rusi will be sorely missed, and our hearts go out to her family and friends, along with our deepest condolences. Uh, we also got another comment uh, coming from Gary Marsh, who is the uh, president and chief creative officer of Disney Channels Worldwide, and Gary stated, Rusi was every bit as sweet, eff effusive, stylish, and fun-loving as Minnie Mouse, as the Minnie Mouse character she voiced. Throughout her illustrious career, and certainly for dozens of characters she played for us on Disney Junior and Disney Channel, she approached her work with meticulous and loving care, ensuring that every character she created was embraced and adored by generations of viewers. She was a wonderful person and a friend to everyone at Disney Television Animation, and we extend our deepest sympathies to her family and loved ones. We also have another quote coming from Rick Dempsey, the senior vice president of Disney Character Voices. As Rick stated, Rusi Taylor embodied the character of Minnie Mouse. She truly was one of the kindest, most gracious, upbeat, and loving people I have ever had the privilege to work with and to count as a friend. Any uh, anytime anyone met Rusi, their day would always get such a little bit brighter. Not only was she amazingly talented and gifted, but she had a true desire to make the world a better place with the gifts she was blessed with. The world has lost a real treasure. She will truly be missed, but her voice will live on. And I do have one more quote that um, I want to read out. And this is from a very longtime friend and colleague. And this is actually from Bill Farmer, the voice of Goofy. As Bill stated, uh, Rusi was as close as family, as wonderful, funny, and sweet as Minnie Mouse, and as talented yet humble as you would expect. I will deeply and dearly miss her. And on top of that, uh, one more, uh, another thing that I do want to add, actually, you know what, there was something that, uh, I just re realized that I kind of skipped over and it was kind of like the origins of why is it that she went into voice acting? Why did she end up in the position where she was the voice of Minnie Mouse and she decided to do this, just voice acting in general? Uh, there's actually a cute little story right over here. And uh, it says, born in Cambridge, Massachusetts on May 4th, 1994, Rusi had a desire to work for Disney since childhood. When I was a little girl, I was with my mom and my brother, and it was late at night at Disneyland. We, we had just come off the Mark Twain riverboat, and we were getting some popcorn. I looked over and saw Walt sitting on a bench. So we introduced ourselves and shared our popcorn with him. At one point during our chat, he asked me what I wanted to do when I grow up, and I said, I want to work for you. So he said, okay, and now I do. So that was pretty much the cute little origin of um, how Rusi pretty much grew to become a Disney legend, and it was from that life-changing spark of a moment when she actually met Walt Disney himself, and little did Walt know that he actually met Minnie Mouse, or who uh, the person who would eventually become Minnie Mouse.
But it's not just Minnie that she has voiced, of course. Um, throughout her career, she has provided the voice of many, many, many other characters. And it even stated here uh, regarding some of the roles that she has done, including a nurse mouse in The Rescuers Down Under, and another famous character of Disney's that she has voiced is actually Huey, Dewey, and Louie, along with Webby in the original DuckTales series. And from there, she also went and voiced several other characters for Disney. Uh, she provided her voice in many animated shows, including Tailspin, uh, The Little Mermaid series, Buzz Lightyear of Star Command, Kim Possible, Sophia the First, The Lion Guard, and even Tangled the series. And from there, we also got other voices that she has done outside of Disney, ranging from characters in uh, Strawberry Shortcake, she did Baby Gonzo in Muppet Babies, she was uh, at one point the voice of Pebbles from the Flintstones, uh, she was Duchess the Cat from Babe, uh, she was also in uh, Jakers, The Adventures of Piggly Winks, and she was also a very prominent voice in The Simpsons, where she was the voice of uh, the twins, Sherry and Terry, but probably the most famous Simpson character she voiced was Martin Prince, the chubby little teacher's pet. And that's pretty much the whole thing about um, Rusi Taylor, is that not only did she provide the voice of many beloved and legendary characters, but the biggest of them all is Minnie Mouse. But one thing that I will say that I really do appreciate from Rusi Taylor is that not only was she the voice of Minnie Mouse for over 30 years, but she played a very significant part in enhancing Minnie Mouse. Because if you think about it, if you do look back in some of the early days of Minnie, you don't really think much about her. You, When you think of Minnie, the most that you would think about is that her role would either be like the damsel in distress, or she would just be Mickey's girlfriend. And that's pretty much... Far, as far as she could go with that role, depending on like which cartoons that Minnie would appear in. But then when Rusi Taylor came in, that's when Disney decided to be a little bit more experimental and prominently display Minnie more as a female icon. Which you may be surprised, but it's actually pretty rare for Disney to actually have a female icon outside of the Disney princesses. Like, really think about it. Like, at the most that you would have, it would be, like, Mary Poppins, and that's pretty much it. So, expanding Minnie to become a lot more than that is actually, well, even at the time, it was very progressive, you know? And it really was helpful to show Minnie that she is much more than just the girlfriend, or the damsel in distress, or just the girl version of Mickey. And she really went out and gave her a massive identity. And you could see in many of the roles that she would play that Minnie is much more than just like, uh, like you know, just Mickey's girlfriend. And I remember some of the more extensive roles, some of the bigger parts that she would play. Like uh, one that I remember the most that we, we see... A lot more out of Minnie is uh, the House of Mouse. And I grew up watching uh, the House of Mouse where uh, she really was a major assistant running, you know, really trying to make sure that everything goes well with the show of uh, the House of Mouse. And, uh, and on top of that, you, like you do see other roles that Minnie would eventually play later on that um, you would see more of a sassier side, you know, she's not all lovey-dovey, like, sometimes she can get serious against Mickey, you know, sometimes there would be conflicts, and even just recently with the, uh, recent Mickey Mouse cartoons, with those ones, man, they really do extend Minnie, like, they, they really do play around with a lot of, uh, of the characters, especially with, uh, Minnie Mouse, in fact, uh, last week when she passed away, one clip that was often shared was what many people say is uh, one of the last things that we have heard Rusi Taylor perform as Minnie Mouse. And it's actually this entire song number where Minnie was singing this love ballad to Mickey. And from there, there would be this entire cartoon sequence where, like, they're on a boat, but the boat would be drifting off. And then suddenly, like, Minnie doesn't want to interrupt Mickey, uh, Minnie uh, or Mickey. Yeah, did I say? 
yeah, I think I said Mickey doesn't want to interrupt Minnie, so he tries to make sure that everyone is safe and the boat is perfectly fine, but then, like, Mickey would find himself in, like, in the Amazon or in, like, this log log factory or all kinds of stuff. Like, you see him hopping from all different places around the world while Minnie is completely oblivious to this and she's just serenading her song uh, in the hopes of, uh, you know, to woo Mickey and stuff like that. You know, it really was a funny and very well done sequence and especially on Rusi Taylor's part uh, just singing that song. Like, if that was the final thing she performed as Minnie, then, man, she really went out with a bang with that one. But that that's pretty much the point that I want to come across with uh, Rusi Taylor and what she has done for Minnie is that she really did play a massive part in growing Minnie Mouse to become much more than just Mickey's girlfriend to show how she is one of the most important Disney characters and why she truly is a part of the big five. And it's not just with Minnie, of course. I'm sure a lot of you have fond memories of different characters outside of Minnie that were voiced by Rusi Taylor. Uh, rather it be through the original DuckTales series with Huey, Dewey, and Louie, or even with um, Muppet Babies, where she was the voice of Gonzo. Or um, one thing that I know I'll have a lot of memories with is actually with her performance as Martin Prince. And I mean, like, there are moments that you can hate on Martin because, yeah, he's like the nerdy teacher's pet. And it's kind of like a jab on those kids who think that they're the best because they do well in school and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, there are some moments that you can't help but love Martin and some great performances actually did come out. Uh, not just like with Martin and some of the physical things that would happen to him, but also through the performance of Rusi Taylor. And especially the fact that w when you would think that she doesn't just do women char uh, women characters, but also she would provide the voice of like many different kid characters, it really shows the versatility and the talent that Rusi Taylor has. And um, it goes without saying that she's not just a voice actress, but she really is a voice acting legend and it really is um rather depressing and kind of sad that um such a legend like Rusi Taylor had to go because she really did so much uh for animation and especially for voice acting uh, not just uh you know providing the voice of many beloved characters but really taking some of the characters we already know about like Minnie and really enhancing them to become bigger and better and to leave her off as a much more stronger character that can have a, a bigger impact for young viewers that Minnie has now fully grown into a full-on role model for them that kids can look up to Minnie as someone that they could aspire to be. And th th that's going to be one thing that I, I will truly miss. It's, it's going to take some time for me to adjust to whoever the new Minnie is and whoever's going to get the part, whoever's going to be the next Minnie Mouse voice. Uh, I wish them the best of luck for it. And um, hopefully they will go and uh, do their best in order to fill in the big shoes that Rusi Taylor has left. And it, it, it might sound sad, but, it, you know, if there is one happy note that I can take from all this is that at long last, um, at least Rusi and Wayne are finally reunited, you know, like that that legendary couple can finally be together once again. So I, I think that's the one happy thing that we could take away from this. But um, other than that, though, I, I just want to say may Rusi Taylor rest in peace. And uh, I, I do wish uh, the very best and my deepest condolences to uh, her friends and family and hopefully um, you know Mi Minnie's legacy can forever grow and live on from there so with that said uh, I would like to go and uh, ask the chat wall what do you guys think or 
what you would you what would you like to say about Rusi Taylor? Um, you know, I, I'm sure you want to go and express express your grievances, but um, I, I would rather do a little bit of a twist. Do you have any memories that you would like to share related to either Minnie Mouse or a character that is voiced by Rusi Taylor? Like, what's your fate? You know, what's your favorite Rusi Taylor moment? I, I think that's something that we would like to to talk about here in the uh, chat wall. Okay, so what do we have here? Uh, let's see now. Uh, has anyone noticed that in this decade, we lost a majority of the main 1987 DuckTales cast? Now that Rusi is gone, Huey, Dewey, and Louie and Webby have reunited with Uncle Scrooge, a.k.a. Alan Young, uh, Mrs. Beakley, Joan Gerber, and Duckworth, uh, Chuck McCann. Uh, some of the last few main DuckTales cast remain today are Launchpad, Terrence McGovern, uh, Frank Welker, who is Bubba Duck, and Tony Anselmo, of course, Donald, May Rusi, Wayne, Alan Joan, and Chuck, rest in peace. And also, uh, don't forget June Foray, since I know she is the voice of, uh, she's the, the voice of Magic of the Spell as well. So if you want to add those people, then also add June. Uh, let's see. As someone who grew up watching a lot of the House of Mouse and Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, it is devastating to see Rusi Taylor taken from us so soon. Uh, she was not just a great voice for Minnie, but the perfect voice for her, and the same can be said for Martin Prince. Godspeed, Rusi Taylor. Not only is she with Wayne now, but she is also with good old Uncle Walt. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I, I wonder how it is that now that, you know, she's gone and she's into another life, you know, it would be funny to see her reunited with Walt. It's like, hey, I worked for you. I did it. <laughs> I, I wonder how Walt would feel about it, you know, just to see that little reuniting moment. I mean, yeah, it's very nice for Wayne and uh, Rusi to be reunited. But I, I would like to see, like, after reading that little story with Rusi and Walt, I, I would like to see those two uh, reunite and, like, share their little talk. It was like, well, Walt, I've been mini, so guess I was right. I did work for you. <laughs> Okay, let's see. What do we, what else do we have? Uh, from the 1980s to now, Rusi has entertained fans from around the world with her voice, whether it would be for the Disney shorts, DuckTales, the Flintstones, or even the Simpsons. May she finally reunite with Wayne in the heavens. She will definitely be missed. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, let's see. Uh, my favorite voice role of Rusi is her performance in The Rescuers Down Under as the nurse mice, especially the part where the nurse mice... Uh, we're about to fire the tranquilizer double barrel gun onto Wilbert. Uh, the scene makes me laugh hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is definitely true. And, and I mean, even though it is a small role, like, she does play that little mouse character very well. And, and you know, the funny thing is, is that you can hear a little bit of Minnie, but you can tell that it's not legitimately Minnie. So, you know, that, that, you know, it is a little tricky thing, but she can, she can perform female mice well, rather it be as Minnie or like as another one as a nurse mouse. It, it, I, I guess you could say it's one of the most overlooked performances that she has done, but definitely a, an effective one. It, it, it does make a great comical scene in The Rescuers Down Under. Uh, let's see now. Uh, Rosie Taylor, in my opinion, is definitely Minnie Mouse because, as you said, she made Minnie more than just a love interest. Tara Strong also had some nice words to say about her since they worked together on Jakers. Oh, that's very nice. Uh, let's see. Uh, do we have anything else? I'll just read one more because I, I know, like, a lot of the comments are getting, uh, very sad. Uh, I'll miss her very, very much. One of my favorite moments in her performance of Minnie Mouse is recent- is in the recent Mickey Mouse cartoons. I also like Martin Prince. One of my favorite Martin Prince moments was when he was trying to be cool. Overall, her voice will be missed. Yeah. Like, I I'm sure that's going to be one thing that we will miss is going to be when we're going to go and see her uh, as Martin Prince. Because there's a lot of def uh, definitely funny Martin moments. And I remember with her passing not too long ago, I saw that there was actually this one clip that was actually really funny. Uh, and I remember it was the episode with uh, the, 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 the battle between like Springfield and Shelbyville with, uh, with the lemon tree. It, for those of you Simpson fans, you might remember the episode with the lemon tree and that there's like this whole clone of the Simpsons characters, except like you got the Shelbyville versions and you got um, like, you, you have to have like the, the pairing of Martin Prince and Nelson where, uh, Mar you know, Martin is trying to be tough like Nelson, but then Nelson has to come in to save the day. It's like, 
Ah, oh, man, I'm not usually with this guy, but you know, I, I gotta do this. <laughs> and, then, and then, like, as they walk out, like, you see Martin Prince, like, just, like, prancing along, singing a little tune, like, some kind of, like, medieval band. It was, it was hilarious. Oh, my God. I, I'm gonna, I'm definitely gonna miss Martin. I definitely will. And I'll certainly miss Rusi as well. Okay, so with that said, I'm sure we have all shed some tears, but now it is time that we are going to go and jump onto our next story, and this is where things get a bit interesting, because this is a bit of news that might have angered some individuals, some people got upset that this news even happened, or that this success has even occurred. But there is a little bit of a dose of reality that I want to dish out, or at least a little bit of my opinion on the whole situation regarding this whole thing, because I'm just going to give you a little bit of a warning right now. What I'm about to say could get controversial, and these things might even upset you, but I feel like they do have to be said. I do have to go and get this off my chest. I do need to go and express my thoughts on the whole situation of what is happening. So just, just a heads up, you will be warned. Uh, or you have been warned. That's the proper vocabulary of that. But anyways, with that said, let us go and talk about The Lion King. Yes, this week, The Lion King remake has made a grand total of $1 billion at the box office in just 19 days. Yes, folks, a lot of people are saying that it could be a bit of a record, but maybe not. But still, it is something that went by pretty quickly. Where in just 19 days since its first release in China on July 12th, The Lion King remake has accumulated a worldwide total of $1 billion. And this pretty much has made it so far the 22nd movie by Disney to have crossed the billion dollar mark. And uh, so far, it is the fourth Disney movie this year that it has actually made a billion dollars at the box office. Uh, just right behind, of course, Avengers Endgame, or technically you could say Avengers Endgame twice, uh, Captain Marvel, and also the Aladdin remake. And on a side note, uh, what is actually interesting... Oh boy, wow, that was a bit unexpected. I tried fighting back, but, uh, well, as you can tell, I lost. <laughs> but anyways, back to what I was talking about. Uh, in regards to making it to a billion dollars, um, it's actually quite an impressive feat of the fact that uh, The Lion King made it in 19 days, because in the case of the Aladdin remake, that actually took it uh, an entire two months to go and actually achieve that. And even in the case of Toy Story 4, that's soon going to be the next one to go and make a billion dollars at the box office, but not yet. But that is actually something that it's been more than a month now since it has been released, and that has yet to actually make it. But The Lion King somehow, it just made it in a snap. Now, the thing is... Why I want to go and discuss about this, and why I said that uh, this is uh, a news that did upset some people, that frustrated some folks, is mainly because uh, a lot of people really hate this Lion King remake. And I mean, I do understand the frustrations. I'm not a fan of the Disney live action remakes either. You know, I, and I do see them as just like a whole bunch of inferior versions of the original animated films, and it kind of tarnishes uh, what the original has pretty much built in the first place. Now, I do, like I said in my review of the uh, remake of The Lion King, there are some that I do enjoy myself, you know. Uh, I really like the Jungle Book remake, and also the Cinderella one was fine, but the rest, uh, they either range from meh to absolute crap. And the thing is, is that Right now, the hate on it, it really has gone extreme, though. I would even go in debate and say that The Lion King remake is one of the most hated movies of the year. Like, I would say close to the levels of the Emoji movie in terms of the backlash and in terms of the hate that it has received. 
Which is kind of strange because technically it's not necessarily as bad as something like the Emoji Movie. So far it only got mixed reactions and there, there are some positive things to say about the Lion King remake as well. But in terms of the anger that people have with the Lion King remake, oh boy, like it has gotten massively out of hand. Like when I would go on social media, I would actually see a whole bunch of people say that oh, they hate the Lion King remake, and th even it would grow to an extent that they hate Disney in general, that they're pretty much vilifying Disney for these live-action remakes. I've seen some people making claims that the public is losing interest or they're losing their trust for Disney because of these remakes, or they're lo or pretty much, uh, uh, like, I've even seen people go as far and say that Disney is currently in the dark ages of Disney live-action films because of these remakes. And they would go and make all these claims and all these accusations in order to go and express their anger and their hatred towards the live-action remakes and, you know, saying these outlandish things like that. Now, if I may go and put in my little piece on this, I would say that the claims that oh, the public is losing their trust uh, again for Disney, or that they're in the dark ages of their live-action films, I would say that is not true at all. Like, I'm not even going to say that I disagree. I'm just going to flat out say that that's a full-on freaking lie. Calling this the dark ages of Disney live-action films, it could not be further from the truth. Because let me tell you why. Okay, whenever you would say the dark age of something, like the dark age of Disney. What that usually means is not about the quality of the movies themselves, but rather it emphasizes how they're doing in terms of their business. That if this is the dark age of Disney, then that would mean the business of Disney is not necessarily doing well. That they, you know, that the money is not pouring in, their movies are continuously flopping one after another, their films are continuously underperforming, and that, you know, they're struggling to maintain their foundation. And that's not what's really happening right now, because here's the thing. When you look into Disney Animation, Disney Animation has three different Dark Ages, if you may recall. There's one in the 40s, there's one in the 80s, and there is one in the 2000s. Now, the 40s was a dark age for Disney animation, mainly because it was during the time of World War II. And Disney kind of got tangled up when America was at the height of like being involved with World War II and fighting against the far right and against the Nazis and all that kind of stuff. So from there, Disney they didn't really have a lot of money because a lot of their resources had to be used in order to go and create uh, World War II cartoons and to go and help with the government. So it leaves out with very little money in order to go and actually make movies. At the most they could make was just Song of the South, but the rest were all just package films. Stuff like Make My Music, Melody Time, Fun and Fancy Free, The Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad. It wasn't a strong time for Disney. That's why Cinderella back then was viewed as a huge risk. It was either all or nothing. If Cinderella flopped, then that was it for Disney. Like, they were pretty much done. And then you got the second Dark Age, which was the 1980s. Or some people could say that it is both the 70s and the 80s, but it's primarily the 80s where Disney was at its darkest moment. Because that was during the period when Disney had yet to go and fully recover from the passing of Walt Disney. And they were pretty much cursed with the mentality of what would Walt have done, which was not really the best business strategy to go towards in terms of getting finances and in order to make some massive hit movies. It didn't really work out as well. And even with the animated films, they were making a lot less than usual and very few even came out. And very few of them were even that successful. Like maybe uh, The Fox and the Hound did actually well, but then you had The Black Cauldron and that was infamous for being a massive flop. There's a reason why the Black Cauldron is still considered the black sheep of Disney to this day. And then you had the third 
dark uh dark period or uh, the dark age of disney which is in the 2000s and this was straight after the disney renaissance where they were releasing hit after hit after hit but apparently that streak was pretty much broken when they entered the 2000s yes they had lilo and stitch and that one actually performed very well for them but then they had movies like fantasia 2000 atlantis the emperor's new groove treasure planet home on the range all of which and even Brother Bear, most of which, if not all of them, pretty much flopped at the box office. Some of them even box office bombs. And they were pretty much struggling to go and catch up, especially when now more competition was pretty much coming out of the woodworks, especially with stuff like Pixar, with DreamWorks and Blue Sky, all coming in with the new fascinating technology of computer animation. So even afterwards, when they converted into computer animation, they still had a bit of a tough time trying to go and catch up with the rest of the people, like with Chicken Little, uh, then with Meet the Robinsons, with Bolt and the Princess and the Frog. It wasn't until Tangle came in that that was the moment when finally they can pick themselves back up their feet and really go up from there. So that's what it means to be a dark period of Disney, to go and not do well on the business side. So when you go and look into these Disney live action remakes, they're some of the most successful movies that we got so far. In fact, some of the most successful movies this year are Aladdin and The Lion King. I mean, most of which are just massive hits when you go and think about Maleficent, Jungle Book, Cinderella, like all of which uh, they have made over $750 million and Jungle Book was actually close to a billion. And, and then um, like you would get plenty of others like Be the Beauty and the Beast remake, the Lion King remake, the Aladdin remake, and like all these things, like they're... Like, they already crossed the billion dollar mark. And I mean, sure, you do have a significant few that aren't necessarily as successful. Like, um, you got a few modest hits, like with Pete's Dragon and Christopher Robin. And then, of course, you got Dumbo, which that one is the first of the Disney live action remakes that is actually a box office bomb. But still, like, Disney could afford it. Like, they're actually doing extremely well with these live-action remakes. Not to mention the success of plenty of their other films that they got. With the Disney animated films, with Disney Animation and Pixar, they're doing massively well and even more successful than any other animated films that would be released during that time. And even, like, with the other stuff, especially Marvel and Star Wars. They are making massive money for Disney down to the point where it doesn't matter if they have some box office bombs. Heck, they actually made some of the biggest box office bombs of this decade with movies like Mars Needs Moms, John Carter, uh, what else? Tomorrowland, A Wrinkle in Time, Solo, A Star Wars Story, and of course the already mentioned Dumbo. Those were major bombs that cost Disney millions. But because of the success of the Marvel films, of the Disney live action remakes, and with the Star Wars films, they could afford it. They're perfectly fine. So in terms of the business side, right now, it's not a dark age at all. It's very successful. But then again, some people could argue, well, technically, it, they, they want to say it's the Dark Ages because of the quality of the animation. It's the quality of the movies themselves. Well, even at that, to be very honest, even if you're just referring to the Disney live action remakes, they're not really that much hated. You're not going to see any critics or film enthusiasts even put any of these Disney live action remakes among like the worst movies of the year or stuff like that. I wouldn't even see The Lion King be considered one of the worst films of the year. And even I'll admit, I didn't really like it and I do think that it is an inferior version to the animated film or at least the original film. The, the thing, there are some actual good merits that I would like to count on it. Like the visuals themselves, maybe they're not a fit to this movie in particular, they're still amazing and you still got some good performances out there like with Billy Eichner and Seth Rogen, like, they did a pretty good job. There are some good points to count. And even at that, like, most, like, the grand majority of these Disney live-action remakes are a mixed bag anyways. And if you say that Disney live, like, technically, that's the reason why you want to count it as a dark age of Disney, li uh, of Disney live-action films, technically, if you're going to bring in all the live-action of the Disney live-action films then that means we're also going to be bringing in the Marvel and the Star Wars films. And those movies 
With every single one, they have been highly praised by both critics and audiences. At worst, they're just okay. But at best, oh my god, people are absolutely adoring it. Like, regardless of what it is, the Avengers movies, the Iron Man movies, uh, Ant-Man, or what have you on the Marvel side, or Thor, or um, like the Guardians of the Galaxy, Black Panther, or even in the Star Wars side, like The Force Awakens, The Last Jedi, uh, Solo, uh, the Rogue One. Like, all these movies are very well liked by critics, and most audiences really do enjoy it. Yeah, I know some people are going to come in with the freaking comments about The Last Jedi and the haters and stuff like that. Well, I'm just going to be honest. No, they, like, honestly, for those people whom to this day still have a rage against or, like, have this passionate grudge against The Last Jedi, their opinions don't matter because, let's be honest, those guys don't know Star Wars. They don't own Star Wars. They know nothing about Star Wars, so their opinion is invalid. I don't care what they have to say, especially if they're going to go on racist and sexist tangents, like claiming like these SJW reasons on why Star Wars The Last Jedi is bad. It makes no sense, and no, it do like what they're saying doesn't even exist, so screw those guys. So The, the Last Jedi is still beloved by the grand majority of people. So that's the thing. The fact that, like, you look at all these different movies, like with the Marvel films, with the Star Wars films, and yes, even with the Disney live action films, there is nothing that indicates that this is a dark age for Disney live action films whatsoever. But it does raise a, a pretty interesting question that some people view the fact that a lot of people don't like these Disney live action remakes. But yet, how is it that something like The Lion King managed to make a billion dollars in just 19 days? Why is it that it got massively popular? And why is it that most of these Disney live action remakes ended up making so much money at the box office? Well, that's something I would like to go and tell you. There is actually a very good reason because here's a little secret, guys. I want you to listen carefully. These Disney live action remakes are not made for you. They're not made for the Disney geeks. They're not made for the film buffs. And they're not made for the animation fans. The, pe the target audience that Disney wants to do for these live action remakes are for the casual viewers. The kind of people that maybe their passion isn't necessarily on movies or on animation or on Disney. But rather, they're just the, the average people whom from time to time... They would like to go and um, go see a movie as, you know, a fun little activity that they would like to do in their free time or on the weekend or something like that. Just a fun little thing. And they're not expecting too much out of it. They're not going to be judging it as they're watching it. You know, they paid their ticket. They went out of their way to go and drive to the movies. They're going to go and sit down and just have a good time. And if they enjoyed the experience, rather it be mildly or massively, then they'll say they'll like it. It's made for the average people. It's made for the casual viewers. It is for them. And those are the people that are the ones that Disney wants to go and try to appeal. And what Disney is asking is not necessarily for you to go and love the movie, to say good things about the movie and that's it. They're not asking you to make your opinion be positive about the movies that they make. Like, whatever you think about these films, you can think whatever you want. What? But all they ask you to do is just go and go to the movies, buy a ticket, and sit and enjoy their movie. Just sit and watch their film. That's all all they ask to do they, that, that's all they ask you to do and if that's what you did then you're doing exactly what disney wants you to do that's pretty much the main thing about it and the thing is is that this formula with the disney live action remake so far it's doing very very well for disney for them that's for them like all the all the tickets that are being bought that's a signal that people are really liking what Disney is doing. So there's a bit of a formula that's going on that they're doing that it's working out very well and even debatably more so than any other studio is currently doing with their movies. 
So why stop there when it's something that, of course, it's working, that people are buying, that people are really talking about, that it's really pro that that's really making Disney a lot of profit? Like, why stop there? The casual viewers seem to really enjoy it. But in the case of you, though, with the fans, with the uh, Disney fans, the animation fans, with the film fans, the sad reality is, is that in terms of you guys, you're, you're like, the, the truth is, is that you're, you're only a small percentage. You're like, you're, you're only like a fraction compared to the general public, to the casual viewers that are all out there. And the, the reason why, like, you see a lot of these fans that are just angry at Disney, again, like with all these live action remakes, with all like, you know, taking these animated films and turning them into big blockbusters with A-list celebrities and stuff like that. When you see them raging, it's mainly because you don't see them go out of their little bubble. And that's the problem is that these fans, they, you know, they're stuck in their little safe space with like-minded people just parroting the same opinion over and over to the point that it makes them mentally uh, twisted to believe that it's like what they're saying. It's like my opinion is right and everyone else is wrong. That they didn't take the time to look at the world around them to look outside of their bubble to actually go out and see how average people actually think about something like the lion king the kind of people that they don't rate movies with a, a one out of ten or a ten out of ten or everything in between that they just judge movies either with just a thumbs up or a thumbs down and that's pretty much it they need to just go and get out of their bubble and yet like i i just see people go in, go out of their way and really make these wild claims. And that's the reason why you would see people make these uh, conspiracy theories and just spread them all out. It's mainly because they're, you know, they're stuck in their little bubble. They're stuck in their little safe space that they don't see anyone else's opinion other than their own. And, you know, that, that that's the part as to why you don't see, like, the opinion of the outside world. See how others are viewing it. And why they see, like, and that's how, how they seem to be lost and confused as to why something like the Lion King remake seems to be such a big hit. And I, I'm just going to go, and I will, you know, and before I continue, I just want to say, though, that if there is one thing that I do agree, that um, there is a little something that, yeah, maybe Disney did a little bit wrong that they should have is that, Maybe they should have given royalties to the original creators. That I do agree with, considering that these are the people that actually made the original that the remakes are based on in the first place. But other than that, like just seeing, uh, like just seeing a whole bunch of people just vilifying Disney and making these baseless claims about Disney, like making things up, judging on their opinions on the movies, it's just absolutely ridiculous. It's just like when I would see people making these weird claims that apparently Galaxy's Edge at Disneyland was a massive flop. It was a disaster for Disney, and yet, like I look at them. And, and all I can think of is just, like, you guys have no freaking idea what you're talking about. Like, these are people who, like, they don't know anything about, like, the theme park business and stuff like that. And it honestly really shows because, like, Galaxy's Edge, as I'm recording this at Disneyland, it's, like, I don't think it's even, yeah, it, maybe it is. It's just around two months old and that's pretty, you know, like, it's, it's still fresh. It is still brand new. That is not enough time to really determine if it actually is a success or if it actually is a bomb. Especially from the people who actually did go to Galaxy's Edge. They say it was absolutely fantastic. Like, apparently, so far with Smuggler's Run, it was an absolute hit. So, honestly, like, it, it's some like it's the same kind of mentality. Is that the reason why you hear things like, oh, Galaxy's Edge was a bomb. It was a disaster for Disney. It's mainly because it's coming from people who don't go out of their safe space, that they stay within their personal bubble and make conspiracy theories that are not actually true when they're not looking into the outside world and see why things are being so successful like Galaxy's Edge or with the Lion King remake. And with that said, though, if, if there is one little lesson that if you if you guys should take from all this and, and this is honestly a little lesson that i've learned myself that it, it took a little while for me to go and learn and there are some people that tried their hardest in order to make me learn this lesson and some frustrations had been shared and a little bit of drama but 
now that I did have this message in my head, um, ever since then, I have been very thankful to these people who came in and, uh, may, you know, try to have me, have me sit and talk and just, uh, make me learn to make me understand this. And this is something that I want to share with you guys, what I have learned now, just because they have made some movies that you don't like, that doesn't make the company making them evil. That's the thing that I want to go and teach you. You may not like these live action remakes and that's perfectly fine. Whatever opinion you have on them, that's okay. But going as far and try to go and frame them as the bad guys just because you don't like them, that's when you're kind of pushing it a little bit too far. And uh, there are a few examples of what I mean to give you a better perspective of what I'm talking about. And a great one is actually with the Camp Coral controversy with the uh, SpongeBob spinoff. Now, whatever opinion that you have with Camp Coral, that's perfectly fine. Whatever you think, you can approve of it. You may not. And, you know, what, whatever claims that you may have, that's perfectly fine. But when you would go as far as making these crazy conspiracy theories against Nickelodeon or even against the whole animation industry, that's the moment when you are taking things too far. I have heard some insane claims just because of the creation of Camp Coral that, oh, they're making a SpongeBob spinoff. That means Nickelodeon is filled with evil tyrants and all they care about is greed. Nickelodeon is evil and we should put so much hate on them. Or even there's another claim I've heard that, oh, Nickelodeon is making a Spongebob spinoff with Camp Coral. That just goes to show how the entire animation industry is so corrupt. Like, are you freaking kidding me? Like, it shocks me to no end that there has no, there has been no one in the cartoon community that has called them out on making InfoWars level conspiracy conspiracy theories toward just because of the announcement of a Spongebob spinoff. Like, regardless of what you think about Camp Coral, don't you think that these claims are absolutely ridiculous? Especially from the fact that they are coming from people who had never worked in the animation industry in their lives, naughty, like, like not even in freaking Nickelodeon. Like, this is honestly something that really does go to show that the cartoon community knows absolutely nothing about how the business of the animation industry works. And I can pretty much completely understand why is it that real animators actually hate cartoon reviewers like myself. And it kind of makes me a bit ashamed of being a cartoon reviewer, actually. But, I digress. Now, this is just one example, but if you want a better example of what I mean with these Disney live action remakes, here's a better one. I think this is gonna be one that if the last one didn't sell it to you, then this one certainly will. Okay, now hear me out on this. Imagine if I went in and I told you that everything after Surf's Up and everything before Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse is the dark ages of Sony Pictures animation. Everything about it is the dark ages where all their movies are absolutely terrible, they made Sony Pictures Animation look bad, and I hate these movies so much, and every single one that they have produced is just garbage. Now from there, if I told you that, would you think that I'm telling the truth? Would you think that you would agree with what I just said here? Most likely not. So, what makes you think it's any different when you see people making these claims that Disney live action films are in the dark ages, just because the, like they don't like these live action remakes. you Again, it's okay to not like them. You can have whatever opinion that you want. But if you're going to go to the point and completely demonize the company for it, that's when you're going to go and take things too far. And it really goes to show how you know absolutely nothing about the film business. Disney is not evil for making these live action remakes. And the thing is, is that... If you really do believe that like Disney is evil or that people are losing their trust, then obviously you need you need to get a life. You need to go outside of your bubble and see the world around you and see how the average people that are not like you, like people who are not film fans, see what they think. I mean, the numbers don't lie. 
if they're ma if they're making a billion if they're constantly making a billion dollars with these movies then disney must be doing something right so overall the thing is disney is not evil for doing this they're just playing the game of capitalism and they're playing the game of capitalism very well and if you don't like how capitalism is doing right now then i suggest you should go and support socialism and th with that said that is my entire piece with all this. I know it's really a lot to bring out, but it was just something that I, I just need to get this off my chest. And I do feel like, honestly, the, you know, the rage and the hatred against these live action remakes, even for me, I feel like they're going a little bit too far down to the point that if you're really going to go and antagonize Disney for this, then really the problem is more you than it is with uh, these remakes. So I know that's a lot to say, but with that said, I would like to go and pass on the mic to the chat wall. So I want to know, what do you guys think about all this? So, um, yeah, yeah I, I don't know, like, what else to ask about this. So, uh, just, like, put down your thoughts on everything that I've just said. If you agree, if you disagree, let me know what you think. Oh, boy, my mind is just tired after talking all that. Okay, let's see now. Um, you know, I really don't get why some absolutely fantastic films such as Booksmart and Rocket Man are just left out in the burner at the box office, and a film without a fraction of the emotion or energy of the original gross a full billion. Now, uh, I've got nothing against those who like the movie, but for now, uh, I'm gonna avoid and stick with the classics. However, uh, I have noticed a pattern with Disney's billion dollar movies this year. Two remakes and two MCU movies. Coincidence? Well... Hey, don't forget the Star Wars. Don't forget the Star Wars stuff because uh, that's going to be coming out later. But yeah, and that's another thing that I want to add. Actually, I knew there was one thing I forgot to mention. But yeah, this you know that's honestly another thing about why these movies are successful is mainly because of how you guys don't shut up about it. And, th and that's the thing, it's that people always talk about the Disney's li Disney live action remakes in a negative way, but what they don't know is that they're playing on Disney's favor once again. I mean, like, th like all they can talk about is regarding these Disney live action remakes, which kind of has a reverse effect that would get people curious into knowing what it is, and, like, they'll go and see this for themselves. In, in fact, I just want to say right now that I'm sure that a lot of the success is mainly for hate watching that you know that there are those people that they are angry about these and that they don't they don't like them no matter what like even when they're announced that they already set their bias onto hating them but they don't want to seem stupid when talk talking about this because if they're gonna hate on something that they haven't seen then it kind of makes them look dumb right so from there there are those people who will actually go and buy a ticket and actually see the movie for themselves to go and justify their anger. And then they'll go and spread the word on it about why they hate, you know, why they hate this movie and all that stuff. And it might get some other people curious to go and see this for themselves on, oh, why is this inferior to The Lion King? You know that does play a big part of the success. So if you're going to really hate on it, then really you're just doing Disney a favor by giving out some marketing. I know that it's a long discussion regarding no such thing as bad publicity and all that kind of stuff, but in this case, this is one of those things that, yeah, if you're going to spread bad publicity, that's still good publicity for Disney. So if you really are against this, then honestly, shut up. Actually talk about things that you do like. Talk about the movies that you want to go and support instead of giving more negative publicity to The Lion King or to these Disney live action remakes. Is it hard for you to go and do that instead of just expressing hate? I mean, you don't, you, like, don't, don't act like a freaking Trump supporter and only have your mindset be set on the negative and all you want to do is just hate and destroy. Try to be more positive on that. Try to be anti-Trump and talk about something that you actually do like, that you actually do en enjoy, and that you actually do want to go and support. Is that really hard to ask? That if you don't want to see something, if you don't want to support it, then don't talk about it, don't support it, and just shut the fridge up. Is that really that hard to ask? Okay, let's see now. Uh, uh, let's see what else do we have. I'm going to watch this three days from now. Uh, I'm going to determine whether or not I like it or not. But from the looks of it, I'm not going to like it. Uh, I'm not too big of a fan of the original. 
But I wish that Disney tries something different than what they're doing. Oh, please tell me Lion King 2 Simba's Pride is not going to be remade. That is actually going to be pretty interesting if they actually go towards that route. If they do a Lion King 2. Oh my god. Oh my god. Imagine if they actually go and actually make the, like, not just Lion King 2, but like a full-on, re like a live-action remake of Lion King 1 and a half. Actually, you know what? Considering that Timon and Pumbaa are like some of the best parts of the of the remake of The Lion King, I, I actually would be down for that. I, I wouldn't mind a, a a remake of Lion King one of one and a half with Billy Eichner and Seth Rogen. That might be worth something there. <laughs> okay, let's see. What, what else do we got here? Uh, let's see. Since Disney is o owning so much properties and it got so big it can easily stomp on lesser known studios with original films. Uh, I wish more people saw Once Upon a Time in Hollywood instead. It deserves more money than the Lion King remake. Now that Disney have all the profits, uh, they should pay their workers wages, especially on their theme parks. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, okay. Um, do we have anything else? Uh, oh, we got, oh wow, positive comment on that. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm very proud that the Lion King remake hit $1 billion worldwide. I knew it would happen and I and I hope it beat Beauty and the Beast remake for the highest grossing Disney live action remake of all time. Anyways, uh, I won't be staying here for that long because I'll be going to Amazon Prime early screening for the Angry Birds movie 2 in an hour. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, do we have any other comments from here? I'll, I'll probably read just one more so we can move on. Um, I'm not a fan when it comes to Disney live action remakes. I knew that the Lion King remake was going to make a billion dollars at the box office no matter what. But yeah, I do get your point about people making claims about Disney and the Dark Ages doing live action remakes. I find it ridiculous for some, but I see their points. Uh, movies like this are not for everyone. Even for me, when it comes to nostalgia, I'll respect them no matter what. But this is just out of control. Uh, oh, we actually do have uh, another one. Let's see now. Uh... Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm personally not upset uh, about this news. However, I do understand why people are upset about it. But with the whole new dark age of Disney, it's just ridiculous. Because it's only considered a dark age if it's not making money. So thank you for the agreement with me. Because for a while, I feel like I was the only one who felt this way in the argument. And again, th th that's just what I want to go and say. It's just that the, 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 the live action remakes, you can have whatever opinion. You can support them and you may not. But you got to keep in mind, at the end of the day, they are just movies. No matter, like, no matter what you think about them, uh, like, at the end of the day, all they are, they're just movies are, are movies are movies are movies. And that's it. You don't have to go and make some wild conspiracy theory. You don't have to go and completely antagonize a whole freaking company for just doing their freaking job. So, so that's the thing. Like, don't take these movies seriously. And if you don't want to support it, if you don't want to watch it, just shut up and leave. Just shut up. Talk about something else. That's all I have to say. Okay, uh, let me just get some water here. Whoo, boy, that was a mouthful there. And now it is time that we are going to go and jump onto our next story, in which we actually got some themes park news yes we're gonna be uh changing things up a little bit and we're gonna talk about a big theme park news because there's gonna be something that's already big there there's gonna be something huge that's gonna be coming out there and it's actually from universal in fact some people could say that it, this is gonna be the biggest the biggest expansion that universal is gonna do for orlando in 20 years and now what I'm going to be talking about is actually going to be Epic Universe. Yes, Epic Universe is going to be the third theme park for Universal Studios Orlando, which is going to coincide with Universal Studios Florida and Islands of Adventure. Uh, Universal, Stu uh, Universal Parks and Resorts pretty much had this huge conference about it, revealing a little bit of concept art regarding what this is. But the thing is, is that they were pretty vague on what's going to be in it or even when it's going to be come out. We don't know any release date. We don't know when things are going to be starting in terms of construction. All we know is that this is going to be a thing and that's pretty much it. We don't even know what's in there. We don't know the rides themselves or anything like that. 
All we know is that it's going to be a theme park and it will have a hotel and it'll have an entertainment hub, a shopping district and restaurants. And it even states here, uh, reading from my source here in Slash Film, by the way, Universal's Epic Universe will offer an entirely new level of experience that will forever change theme park entertainment. Guests will venture beyond their wildest imagination, traveling into beloved stories and through vibrant lands on adventures where the journey is as astounding as the ultimate destination. So that's pretty much the whole description of what this is. And on top of that, they have even stated that one great benefit of having Epic Universe is that it will go and create for, uh, over 14,000 jobs for the people in Florida. Now, in terms of what's gonna be in it or where it's gonna be located, actually, we might have a bit of an answer of where it's gonna be located. We actually do have a little bit of a map here. And as you can see, we got the whole area of Universal which is all over here in the top left corner of this image. And if you drive all the way down uh, from Universal Boulevard, or I don't know what the other boulevard is. Like, if you drive down the long road, that's where you're going to find Epic Universe. So, Epic Universe is going to be pretty big, but it is going to be entirely separate from the whole area of Universal Studios. Like, with Universal Studios, Islands of Adventure, and all the different... Uh, shopping districts and hotels like they're all gonna be here but then you got epic universe that's just completely on the side now in terms of what's gonna be in it now as i've stated before we don't really have much of a confirmation of what are gonna be the attractions or what's gonna be the theme of the areas but of course that is where rumors are gonna be coming in and a lot of people have made speculations on which ones are gonna be in there and three of the most common rumors that I've heard about Epic Universe are going to be three things. So I'm going to go in another source. Uh, like here, I'm going to have a, a, a more clearer image of um, Universal, of uh, Epic Universe. So as you can see, in the uh, top corner, like in the center, you'll see in, you'll see there's this big building. And that is said to be, the, the like, this is going to be the hotel. This is where people are going to go and stay. Uh, but then when you go into the left side corner where you see like this little, uh, like little, a bunch of boxes that are all around this, uh, what seems to be this little play area. Some people are saying that this is going to be the Nintendo area. This is going to be the place where you're going to go and ride attractions like the Yoshi ride, the Donkey Kong roller coaster, and the highly anticipated Mario Kart ride. That apparently that's going to be the area for Mar uh, Mario uh, for the uh, Nintendo Land. That's going to be right over here for Epic Universe. Uh, but then there is also on the top right corner where you see just right behind the fireworks. Uh, like you see, it's kind of like a little area. It seems like a, a little bit narrow and stuff like that. Some people are actually saying that this is going to be the area that will be themed to Fantastic Beasts and where to find them. Considering that Harry Potter has been doing extremely well, both critically and financially for Universal Studios in the parks all around the world, it wouldn't be that big of a surprise that they want to go and try to extend that with a new attraction uh, right beside uh, Epic, you know, like for Epic Universe, that they want to go and expand it to have the characters from Fantastic Beasts. And then you would have this little corner right over here, just on the left of the hotel, like you see this purple ominous area, and a lot of people are saying that this is going to be the place where it will be based on the classic Universal Monsters. So this is going to be a spooky area where you're going to go and meet up with Dracula, with Frankenstein's monster, with uh, the Invisible Man, the Wolf Man, the Mummy, and all those guys. Like, they are all going to go and meet up in this area right over here, and you'll have probably some rides that are based on them. Uh, outside of that, there's actually one little section you don't see, but uh, here, if you look into the uh, bottom right corner, there's also going to be this massive roller coaster that they're going to go and develop. Uh, there are some few areas that uh, they have not been disclosed, but you know, so, some interesting places that will probably have a, a specific theme. Knowing Universal, they're going to go and uh, completely based it on brand, so we never know what they're going to do with this. 
Uh, but yeah, those are so far the three, the, like the three most common rumors that we have heard so far about Epic Universal. Now, if this is true, I honestly don't really know, but I will give it to them that it does sound pretty interesting and Universal, they are pretty legit with their stuff. Sometimes when they make some good attractions, they could turn out to be really amazing. And sometimes they can even have the technology in order to go and surpass the stuff that's made by Disney. They're capable of doing that. In fact, uh, not too long ago, uh, they have actually reopened the Jurassic Park ride where now it's more themed to Jurassic World. And so far, that has been getting some massively positive reception. Even though it is based on Jurassic World, uh, the re-theming of it, uh, the new technology that has been added, the upgrades that are in there, that has been highly praised and it still stays true to the spirit of the original attraction. And that is actually something that people have been loving so far. So with that, I it wouldn't be surprising if this is going to be another massive hit for Universal. However, there is actually something uh, that is often criticized so far about Epic Universe, and that is actually regarding the location. And I'll go and find a, a clearer image, yeah. So let me just go and take this picture. Uh, there we go. Let's just, uh, okay, actually, here, actually, uh, just a second. I just want to see Universal Boulevard and Kirkman Road. Oh, Kirkman Road. That's what it is. Okay. Just wanted to double check on the, like the roads. Uh, so yeah, let, let's just go back down to see the image. The biggest problem is mainly, uh, the location. A lot of people have, uh, a massive problem with where it is located because, Quite literally, actually, this whole thing is just out of place. Now, I know some people are saying that, oh, well, technically, like, the distance between Universal Studios and Epic Universe, you know, it, it's pretty much similar to something like the Magic Kingdom and Epcot at Walt Disney World. Well, here's the problem with that. When you think about Walt Disney World, the place is a massive giant hub. Like, even the area that is between Walt Disney World and Epcot, that's still Disney World. You're still in Disney property. Whereas Universal, that thing is a very small hub where everything is so compact and everything is pretty much at a walking distance. Like, you see on this map how everything is so close together, like Universal Studios Florida, Islands of Adventure, and all the hotels are just all close to one another. And then suddenly you got Epic Universe, where it's pretty much a long drive down Universal Boulevard or Kirkman Road, and suddenly you'll end up there. That, that is honestly the part where it seems rather strange and it doesn't really make sense, where you have to leave Universal in order to go into another universe, uh, in, in, in another Universal Park. It, it just seems very strange, and I don't know how Universal is going to go and work that out. Maybe they're going to go and open up a shuttle system where they're going to do like Disney World where you got to go and take buses in or if you want to go from Universal down to Epic Universe. Maybe they'll go and do that. I I'm sure it is a simple solution, but it does seem rather strange where the fact that they're making an entire area completely separate from Universal, it, it almost feels like Epic Universe is not like a, a connect, you know, something that connects with the whole Universal Studios Park. It feels like a whole resort in itself. Like that that's the whole feeling that um, Epic Universe is bringing out with its location. It's the fact that it feels like they're making another entire parks and resort that Universal has two full areas to go and compete with Disney's giant area that they have. Now, I don't know if this is a major plan in the future that they're going to go and try to take more lands in order to go and create more parks or stuff like that. I don't know. Or maybe they're going to go and take more hotels, make it an official Universal property. I'm like, I could be totally wrong on that, but... I, I do find it to be pretty strange in terms of the location. And yeah, I do agree with many of the criticisms that they have. It, it just seems kind of random that they can't make it uh, in connection with the other Universal Studio Parks and just have to make its entire, like just have its whole thing right over here. It just seems a little bit weird per se, at, at least in terms of the perspective of someone like who would go to parks and resorts. Like if you want to like a full universal experience, you'll have everything that's a walking distance, but then you have to take a bus for one of their parks. It just, 
it seems kind of weird. At least Disney has the consistency where everything is pretty distant and you have to take either a car or a bus to go from one place to another. This, I don't know, it just seems strange, but... Uh, either way, I do feel pretty uh, excited and rather curious to know what 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 else is there at Universal. I, I I am I am curious to know what else does Epic Adventure has in store for us. Maybe there will be some new exciting rides. Maybe there won't be. Uh, maybe it's worth going. Maybe uh, like it'll be just a pass and just stick to Universal Studios and Islands of Adventure. But yeah, I can't, I can't wait till more info comes out of this. This will be pretty interesting, and one thing that, as a theme park fan, I will be keeping an eye on. Okay, so with that said, now I want to go into the chat wall, and I would like to ask, what do you think about Epic Universe? Is it something that you guys would be interested in checking out? Uh, would you guys like to know about more information? Would you guys want to give it a pass? Let me know what you all think now. Let's see. Oh, God. <laughs> I will pray tonight for a Shrek land at Epic Universe. Okay, dude, no. There will be no Shrek land in Epic Universe. In fact, let me tell you this, guy. Dude, you don't need a Shrek land. Technically, there already is a little Shrek land at Universal. Shrek 4D is not closed at Universal Orlando yet. So if you still need Shrek and go to Florida, you'll still get that. You don't need a Shrek land because there already is a Shrek land. Okay, let's see now. Uh, I hope this new epic park has adequate parking garages, roads leading to and from, and double the amount of bathrooms. Will How to Train Your Dragon finally get some love in the park? Uh, I wonder how people will feel about having their houses torn down for this park. Um, oh, okay, uh, tore down, I don't know if there is any of that case, I, I don't know, like, I don't know if I've read any of the reports that they are tearing down houses, I don't know if that is true or not, you could correct me if that actually is the case, if you have actually proof, then, uh, do provide that, please, but, yeah, I don't think they, I don't know if they have torn down any houses or stuff like that, I don't think that's how it works, but, um, yeah, I, I'm sure that is something that they better think about, like, having more bathrooms and, like, especially the fact that if they are going to build an entire theme park, then, yeah, like, uh, parking, like, having a massive parking garage needs to be a top priority for that. Uh, let's see now. Woo, okay, let's see. It might be good, but that's not saying much, as Universal Studio got a lot of backlash for closing down classic rides and attractions such as Jaws and Confrontation. They even torn down the Paris Opera set for 1925's Par uh, P Phantom of the Opera, which was the oldest standing movie set. Yeah, that you do have a good point. You know, that that is definitely true. But that that is more the Hollywood side of things, though. But eh, then again, that did happen in Florida as well. But yeah, it, it, it is very unfortunate of the fact that they did tore down that building. I mean... Like, and for the purpose of making more space for some of their rides, like, yeah, it, it does seem pretty bad. Especially, like, like despite some of the praises that I've given to uh, Universal, they have done some pretty crappy stuff. In fact, some people could say that one of the worst rides of the decade was actually from Universal with that Fast and Furious ride that's just a freaking joke. Alright, let's see now. Uh, I was wondering what was all the mean, uh, what was all the mean about Universal Orlando was doing, but now knowing the full picture as well as getting why people are completely upset, but I like you, Matt, I am curious, uh, what will happen to Epic Universe, but should think more about, uh, more throw with this before construction. Yeah, I'm sure eventually Universal has to dish out, like, what kind of rides are gonna be coming out. I mean, they can't just leave us curious knowing what to do. Uh, the main thing that interests me is if uh, the if this is the location of the American version of Super Nintendo World, I would especially love a roller coaster based on Donkey Kong Minecraft levels, and to see if it has if it will have Pokemon representation. Oh yeah, I can definitely guarantee you now. If Epic Universe is going to be the home of Super Nintendo World, it's going to be a hit for sure because like. So far, N Super Nintendo World is the most anticipated thing coming from Universal. People are really hyped up for it. And if it is going to be there, then it will take some time. But honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if that would actually mean that 
Super Nintendo World is pretty much going to be open at the same time as uh, Illumination's Super Mario movie. That would not surprise me at all. So maybe sometime in like 2022 or 2023. But then again, we, we will have to wait and see on that. Okay, I'll just read one more comment and then we'll move on to the next story. I'm not sure about Epic Universe. One, it is a bit far away from the original Universal Resort. But on the other hand, uh, it better be true to its title and deliver something epic. I also wonder if Epic will have a new Nickelodeon studio like the one back in 1990 to 2005. Maybe even a reboot to Legend, uh, Legends of the Hidden Temple. Uh, hmm... I don't know. I, I honestly don't know about that. I, I like, it, it really does depend. Like I under, I know that like they do have a lot of SpongeBob representation, but they don't have the full licensing of Nickelodeon and all that stuff. So I, I, I think that would be a little bit of a stretch. It would be a, an interesting idea, but I honestly don't really think so. All right, let me just get some water right over here. Okay. So, with all that said and done, it is now time that we shall go into... Oh, wait a minute. Oh, yeah, the Jimmy Neutron ride. Well, yeah, that is true, but nowadays they don't have it anymore. So, I just want to lay that down. Okay, but anyways, uh, with all that out of the way, it is now time that I shall go and cover the grand finale. And what I'm going to be talking about, very interestingly enough, it's not going to be about a movie. It's not going to be about a theme park. It's not even going to be about a TV show. But rather, what I'm going to be discussing about is a review. And this week, it seems to be the most talked about review so far by just how weird it came out. Like, especially in terms of the wording. And it really is a case that you better be careful with what you say. And what I'm talking about, it's going to be regarding Dora and the Lost City of Gold. But more specifically, the review of Dora and the Lost City of Gold from The Hollywood Reporter, written by Todd McCarthy. Now, when you would go and read this episode, when you would read this review, things seems to be normal. It's your, you know, it's your typical film review. It's understandable. You know, things are making some sense. But then suddenly you go down into the last paragraph this one right over here and this is where it gets a little bit weird and it made a lot of people rather uncomfortable and if you don't know what i mean here's the he, let me go and read you this uh little paragraph if you know what i'm talking about <clears throat> or if you don't know what i'm talking about so here's the thing what keeps things alive up to a point is the imperturbable attitude of the titular heroine, who is invested with Try and Stop Me Spirit by Isabella Moner, who's actually 18 and looks it despite preventative measures. The same goes for, uh, what's his name? Jeff Wahlberg, who is 19. There's a palpable gap you can't help but notice between the essentially innocent, borderline pubescent nature of the leading characters and the film itself and the more confident and mature vibes emanating from the leading actors. The director seems to be trying to keep the hormones at bay, but there are some things you can't just disguise. Perhaps human nature, first and foremost. Dora seems committed to projecting a pre-sexualized version of youth, while throbbing unacknowledged beneath the surface is something a bit more real. Its presence rigorously ignored. To be believed, this story should have been set in 1955. So the one thing that this guy seems to be criticizing is the fact with Dora is not necessarily getting laid. He has this feeling that Dora and Diego have these urges. They're not kids anymore. They're adults. And they are thirsty as F. They, you know, they, Dora ain't looking for gold. Dora is looking for the D. She needs her cheeks clapped. <laughs> and that's apparently the thing. It's like, the movie seems to be holding that back a lot, but just let it go. Let Dora be wild and get laid. 
So that seems, like, I, I don't know about you, but that seems to be the thing that I and many other people seems to be interpreting what this person is saying as a criticism for Dora and the Lost City of Gold. Now, before I go into this, before I go more into this review, I just want to go and uh, mention something about this uh, little mentality about... Um, you know, when, when, when the hormones kick in. L let me tell you a little bit about hormones and how uh, guys, especially when they think. Now, the thing is, I do understand when some people might have some sexual thoughts when they're watching a movie, when that is something that the movie itself is pointing out. Even in something like family films. Like, a great example would be uh, Disney's Peter Pan or Pixar's The Incredibles. In both these scenes, there are, there is a moment where Helen Parr or Tinkerbell, they take a moment to, to notice how big their butts are. So it wouldn't be that much of a surprise if the viewer themselves would also be thinking about their butts. But that wouldn't necessarily be their fault if the hormones would kick in, mainly because the movie is kind of pointing that out. So that you could pretty much go and give them a pass. However... If the viewer would get some horny thoughts and the hormones seem to kick in on a movie that doesn't specify any sexual jokes or have any sexual references or don't even point out any of the uh, private parts, then that's more on the viewer more so than on the movie itself. Like, here's a great example, and probably the perfect example for this, Hotel Transylvania. I think we can all agree that, for the grand majority of things, it keeps itself as kid-friendly as possible. Like, it's very rare that you would find a sex joke in any of the Hotel Transylvania films. Like, maybe there are a few, I'm not saying they don't exist, but they are extremely rare. However, one thing I can guarantee, I don't think Mavis has any of the sexual jokes or any of the sexual innuendos in any of the Hotel Transylvania films. And yet, that isn't going to stop any of the guys completely lusting over Mavis from making so many weird, freaky, and kinky fan art on DeviantArt, all based on Mavis. So it's not really the movie's fault that Mavis kind of became a sex symbol. It's the fans. But, I'm not saying that to shame anyone, I'm not saying this to make anyone look creepy. Whatever, you know, whatever turns you on, that's perfectly fine, as long as it's all legal, and as long as the thing that you're lusting over is over 18. That's perfectly fine. But in this instance right over here, what makes things kind of creepy, is that this reviewer is bringing up some sexual stuff regarding Dora the Explorer. Now, you can think about many things on Dora the Explorer, but sex is not really one of them. Especially in the animated series, Dora, for the most part, is like this five-year-old or seven-year-old girl at most. So, of course, that's like a major no-no right there. But in here, it seems like, okay, well, they're older right now. Dora has more of a figure on her body. So now that seems like, okay, let's go and talk about sex. And honestly, it's really the the weirdest thing is just the vocabulary of all this. Like, one one of the first things is that um, like right on top when describing uh the actress playing Dora Isabella Moner, uh, who, in which he says, who's actually eighteen and looks it dis uh, despite preventative measures. Does that not sound creepy to you? Does that not sound weird? It's like, well, she's actually 18, but she, well, in the movie, she does look like it. That sounds like a freaking statement from Vic Mignogna in his court case. Like, when he would describe about how he sexually harassed a girl, he would say, like, well, she's 18 now, and she looks 18 when I did it to her, so, yeah, I guess it works out. I guess it's kind of legal, you know what I mean? <laughs> Like, oh my god, like, who, well, she's 18, despite, like, it, somehow it makes things okay, like, somehow that makes things better. 
Because I know that in the movie, technically, with Dora, like, she's supposed to be, like, a teenager. She's supposed to be, like, 15 or 16. And it is technically true that Isabella Moner is actually an 18-year-old girl. But here is a massive catch. And here is something that is completely wrong. The thing is, is that, yes, Isabella Moner is 18. However, she is recently 18. She just turned 18 a few weeks ago. And in the movie, like when she was filming this, she was around 17 at the earliest, like in her late 16s. And that's, that, that's the thing. Mainly, what you are seeing in the movie is a 17-year-old girl. So having the so pretty much making these comments, you're still talking about a 17-year-old girl. You're talking about a 17-year-old girl's sexual urges. And that's just wrong. That's just gross. And especially the fact, if that's not enough, probably the one thing that, like, the one word that people are pretty much disgusted about, uh, the one thing that people have a problem with is actually in the, uh, one of the last, uh, one of the last, uh, sentences is actually right here. While throbbing unacknowledged beneath the surface is something a bit more real. <laughs> like, of course, that is a metaphor. But there are certain words that you cannot use when describing a Dora movie. Like, I don't know about you, but throbbing shouldn't be the best word to describe Dora. <laughs> There's something throbbing underneath, beneath, throbbing unacknowledged beneath Dora. That's just, nah, you, you know, like you're go again, you're going into that weird and creepy territory that not many people should go about, especially regarding a 17-year-old girl that's playing a 16 or 15-year-old. There's just something that's completely wrong. And especially the fact that, you know, what this person is criticizing about is the fact that it's not obviously there. So really the whole thing, especially with my statement earlier, is that Honestly, this whole situation, why it's really controversial is that this is all on the critic. This is the critic's fault that he's having all these perverted thoughts when watching the Dora movie. If the Dora movie isn't showing anything, if it's not really pointing out any form of sexual innuendos, then it's all the critic's fault. However... There is actually one- there is actually one thing that is a lot more insane about this. If there's one thing that's absolutely crazy about this review, it's the fact that he could be right. He could actually have a point. Because keep in mind, folks, even though this review is getting a lot of backlash, even though, like, this review is actually, you know, even though, like, a lot of people are talking about this, um, you know, even though people are going crazy over this review, the thing is, we have not seen Dora. As I'm recording this right now, Nobody has seen Dora the Explorer right now, unless you actually got a very special screening, like this critic right over here. And I doubt that any of you guys have seen this, seen the movie, and I know I haven't seen the movie. So the thing is, is that he could bring up a point where you could go watch the movie, and you'll suddenly be sitting there thinking, Oh, I think I see what he's talking about now. So he could be right on it. I don't know. I haven't seen the film myself, but maybe he has something. You got to realize that there is an element here where you don't, where we honestly don't even know. I mean, of course, common sense say that there is no sexual innuendos or anything like that in a Dora movie because it's a movie based on Dora the Explorer. Why would they have that? It's just absolutely stupid, especially with the fact that it is supposed to be more of a family-friendly movie. You know, this action, you know, this action comedy that both the parents and the kids can go and enjoy. But what if he has a point? Maybe, like, there is something in here that Maybe he could be right. Maybe he's wrong. Maybe he's telling the truth. Who knows? Maybe he could bring up a point, but there is still that element of a mystery to it. But overall, 
Um, if there is one thing that I would say about this, personally, I don't think the guy should be fired for this. I don't think, you know, the, the Hollywood reporters should be punished for any of this. I, you know, like, I, I don't think any of that. I don't have any ill will against the, um, uh, I, I don't have any ill will against the critic. Because if there's one thing that I want to say to the guy, it's just, the dude needs to seriously be careful with what he says on the internet. Because in this day and age, it is very easy for anyone to just pick anything up, twist, like just take a sentence, twist their words, and suddenly make it out as if um, they look bad. You know, like tr just try to like take, you know, take something completely out of context and twist it for the purpose of making the person who said that look bad. And this is something that I know personally. This has happened to me a few times before. Like, I know for a fact that on Twitter, it has happened more than once that someone went onto my VeggieTales review, decided to take one little clip out of context when I said that, oh, Big Ideas is not known for their computer animation, and completely put it out on the internet for the purpose of making me look like a complete idiot who has no idea what he's talking about. And again, this has happened to me more than once. And f this is why the VeggieTale Tales fans, they are not a fan of me. So just a little heads up on that there. But I am high. The point is, is that I am highly aware of how easy it is to take something out of context for the purpose of making someone look bad. And this is a little bit of the case right over here where, the, you know, the guy, you know, this isn't, the, the critic isn't really a bad guy. He just needs to be a little bit careful with what he says and especially he needs to think further about what he's trying to say because y you got like he has to realize that he's bringing the subject of sex in the subject of a movie based on Dora the Explorer and you know that on that basis alone it can go extremely disastrously if, you know, if the circumstances are not met. And honestly, if he would go and make this kind of comment, he should have waited until the movie is actually released so that people could go and see for themselves regarding what he is talking about, regarding if he might have a point with what he's trying to say. Because again, he could be telling the truth on this. Maybe he, maybe there is something that he saw that we have yet to see ourselves because the movie is not out yet. So, honestly, that's the thing that I want to say to the guy is just be careful with what you say on the internet because in this day and age, like, information can be spread fast and false information can also be spread. <clears throat> oh, excuse me, a little spit was just escaping. But you need to go and um, you, you need to be very careful. And th that's the thing that I want to say. Yeah, it is kind of creepy. It is a little bit weird for the guy to bring this up for a Dora movie. But again, I haven't seen it. So maybe he could have a point. But just be careful next time. Just be careful when you would go and say things like that on, um, on something that's obviously based on a kid's property. Because you're not going to do that with something like freaking Angry Birds 2, you know? Like the Angry Birds movie 2, you're not going to go and describe it as something like, Oh, well, Red seems committed to projecting a pre-sexualized version of youth while throbbing un unacknowledged beneath the surface is something a bit more real. Like the reason why these birds are angry is mainly because they want to get laid. These are sexually frustrated birds and they need to rub their cloaca on something. You know, you're never going to hear that. You know, you're not going to say that about freaking Angry Birds movie too. So of course you can't really go out and try to say something like that and, um, you, you know, t take it that far. So that, that's honestly what I want to say. It's just be careful what you say because it could sound absolutely creepy. And in this case, it kind of does. So just really be careful. Okay, so with that said, though, I want to go and um, uh, pass the mic on to the comments. And I want to know, what do you guys think about this review of Dora and the Lost City of Gold? Uh, do you think the guy is a little bit creepy about it? Do you think that maybe he has a point since we have not seen the movie? Let me know what you think. Okay, let's see. That is very disturbing from what the critic has made. 
I, I have yet to see what the critics are going to say about the new Dora movie since the trailer uh, didn't impress me so far. But hearing from the from this critic talking about sex for Dora, that sounds disturbing and creepy. I wish the guy sh shouldn't say that because this sounds creepy when talking about hormonal th feelings. Also, are you going to review this movie when the when that film comes out since uh, this is based uh, off of an animated TV show? Uh, honestly, no. Uh, ju just a quick answer. No, I'm not going to be reviewing it. I'm not that familiar with Dora. I know it's based on an animated property, but it's a little bit out of my league, to be honest. So, uh, yeah, I'm just going to say no to that. Uh, let's see. The review is just proof on why trying to make Dora appeal to teens and adults is a terrible idea. I'm 100% going to skip this and see Angry Birds 2 instead. Also, hearing your comment on Angry Birds 2 is reminding me of the ladies get busy scene in the first movie. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, that is actually true. I did see that not long ago. And yeah, and that's the thing. You know, that again, that's another comment regarding like, yeah, if you're if for some reason you got any sexual thoughts on the Angry Birds movie, well, it wouldn't be your fault because, well, that that's the thing. There's a scene where Chuck, the yellow bird, actually full on said, let's get busy with the ladies and make some eggs. <laughs> So that that's the thing is that it wouldn't be surprising that they would continue that. <laughs> okay. Let's see now. Um this whole review is just baffs uh uh ba baffles oh just baffles me on so many levels, especially when he said that Dora and Diego want each other, which is completely wrong because they are godforsaken cousins. Yeah. Okay, honestly, that that would be that would be true honestly like i don't well technically in, in the critics defense they didn't say they want to go for each other like they're they're mainly just going for you know they just have these urges that that's all that he's implying he's a little bit vague on that but uh they, you know they're not going after each other but yeah it is kind of weird that he would have to bring that up okay uh let's see uh, in the original, uh, in the original show, Dora and Diego are cousins. The reviewer is implying incest on this movie. It's one thing to have incest as fan art on DeviantArt, but the fact that uh, a professional critic is implying incest in the kids. Okay, I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna stop right there. Again, he's not fully implying that there, that D Dora and Diego are going after each other. That's not what he's saying. He never actually said that. He's just saying that they have these urges. There are other kids with them, so maybe they would want them. I don't know. Uh, let's see now. Uh, do we have one more? Okay, I'll read one more. Let's see. Uh, the problem that Dora that doesn't have... S <laughs> oh, boy. A lot of... Wow. A lot of people really do seem to go after the... A lot of people seem to really misinterpret the fact that... Th guys, one more time. It's not about freaking having sex with each other. He didn't imply that Dora and Diego should get laid with each other. He didn't say that at all. He just says that they have sexual urges. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Relax, guys. Okay. You're reading a little bit too deep into that. Okay, uh, th uh, this Hollywood Reporter critic should keep his pants to himself. True is that Isabella Moner is very beautiful and very attractive, but I'm at her age and that's what makes me okay to have a crush on her. And I think that Hollywood Reporter is in his, mi that Hollywood Reporter is in his miss 30s. Um, no, actually, to be very honest, Todd McCarthy, from what I've heard, he's around 70. I, I, I don't think, well, like, you could correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I've heard, yeah, Todd McCarthy, the critic in The Hollywood Reporter, is actually 70 years old. He's not in his mid-30s. He's, well, he's, like, twice that, <laughs> to be honest. And, yeah, and I will agree, Isabella Moner is actually a very attractive girl, but still, it's not really an excuse to really go and make that comment. So, overall, I think we can all agree that like, th this is just a case where you really need to be careful with what you say on the internet, or else you could be passed off as a creep. So, honestly, the guy didn't really think through, like, for me, like, the most positive thing that I could say about this is that, at, you know, at best, the guy didn't really, th he, he didn't think that, he didn't think much further, and didn't realize the consequences of implying sexual comments related to Dora the Explorer. And with that said, I think that should go. 
and wrap things up for this episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast. I told you guys that things would get absolutely insane right over here. It was definitely a lot of fun chatting with you guys about all the latest news that's been happening. Hopefully we can continue the madness on to next week. But with all that said and done, I would like to say thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you guys so much for watching. And until next time, see you later, dudes! Thank <laughs> you.